Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to another edition of OLLI Exchange. I'm Judith Tavano, and I'm a volunteer with OLLI, and it's my pleasure this morning to be interviewing Walter Schmidt. Um, Walter is going to be presenting three classes for us here in May, and I will talk about the first one first. The first one, which you can find on page 30 in your OLLI catalog, is entitled, The Craft of Songwriting, Balancing Form, Feeling, Ideas, and Techniques. It takes place on May 5th, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. in person at Drake Field. The, this class is a prerequisite for the workshops that follow, though you can also just attend the May 5th class, and I'm going to guarantee you're going to have a wonderful time if you do that as well. So the workshop that follows is for those who want to actually try writing a song. And Walter is a wonderful instructor. Uh, full, ex full disclosure to everyone who's listening, I know that Walter is a wonderful instructor because he's in, the instructor of someone very dear to me. And um, I've seen the progress over the years and it's just wonderful. So for those of you who want to try your hand at songwriting, you get an idea in your head, you always wanted to turn it into a song. The workshop is just the thing for you. The workshop is songwriting, techniques, tips, and tricks to get you started. It's also in person at Drake Field, and it takes place on two consecutive dates, May 12th and May 19th. So with all that out of the way now, Walter, so everybody knows when the classes are, knows how to find them in the catalog for more information, um, and has a little bit of information about the content. What I'd like to start out with to get everybody really interested in participating in these classes is to learn a little bit about you and how you got into songwriting. Well, all right, thank you, Judith. That's uh... That's a good uh, a good start, I guess, to to this. I uh, I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, and uh, for three summers, as I was a teenager, my dad sent me out to the farm that my mother grew up on, where my uncle Richard uh, was still working the farm, and he sent me there because he wanted to keep me out of trouble uh, during the summers. Uh, in Fargo, North Dakota. For the life of me, I've never been able to figure out what kind of trouble you could get into in Fargo, North Dakota uh, back back in the 60s. But uh, I ended up uh, spending three summers there working for my uncle. And in the evenings, he would sit down and teach, show me things on the guitar because he was a fairly accomplished guitar player and accordion player. And I took that stuff back home uh, after the summers were over and practiced. And about that time was when the great folk music scare of the 1960s occurred. <clears throat> so at the same time, in the winters, then I was learning Peter, Paul, and Mary songs and Kingston Trio and Pete Seeger and that sort of thing. And those are really my roots, that kind of uh, 60s folk music. And then when... When the Beatles crashed down on America, I started uh, playing, playing rock and roll in a little uh, little band that was absolutely the worst worst rock and roll band in in the tri-state area. <clears throat> but I learned some uh, some stuff about popular music back then. I started writing songs very early on. Uh, they were all pretty ragged. I I recently rediscovered one of them. Uh, my and and believe it or not, my sister still had the lyrics and the chord progression squirreled away in a uh, an archive of of family stuff that she keeps. So it was a delight to go back and and see that first one again. Uh, at some point in my adulthood, I started taking it seriously and keeping track of what I was doing, and I started uh, going out to open mics and performing 
performing my my grown up songs in public. I've played in various little musical ensembles over the years. I don't consider myself a professional musician, but in all honesty, I, I am I'm not, not I'm not a bad songwriter. I'm pretty good at what I do. It's like someone who is a poet who doesn't really do a lot of marketing of his or her poetry, but uh, keeps keeps it's a, keeps a journal or keeps a poetry collection and shows it to a few friends. Uh, and it's a cre it's it's my personal creative outlet. And I'm a big believer that uh, I, that people can find a creative outlet in in lyrics, in singing their own songs. I'm a big believer in poetry writing as well, but that's that's not the topic here today. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm ready for the next question, I guess. Okay. Well, first of all, in your answer, you certainly uh, dropped a number of names that are going to be familiar to those of us who are listening to this um, interview today. And um, I'm sure that um, all of us have taken some inspiration from the various artists that you have mentioned. And, um, and in some ways, I'm going to call you out for being a little bit too modest in your description of yourself, because I understand you have a couple of CDs out. I do. Uh, actually, I have one that uh, I did just before I moved to uh, Northwest Arkansas the second time about seven or eight years ago. I was living in Denver at the time, and I had a CD done uh, called Big Fat Moon. And uh, I just before COVID hit, I started the work on a second CD, and it, it ran smack dab into COVID. And so it has been, as, as I felt comfortable going into the studio, I have d done bits and pieces of that over the last two years, and it is now at the, the in, in production. I expect to have a delivery of uh, of copies of that by the by early May, as well as distribution on all the the streaming the streaming sources. It's an interesting issue for for folks like me these days. Lots of people don't even have the resources to play cds anymore they're not you know cars stereos don't don't aren't made with cds anymore and a lot of people just say say to their little device play play walter schmidt and and so so i will in addition in addition to actually having physical copies of the cd i will also be available on those streaming sources so that that's a new thing for me well that's terrific <clears throat> Um, okay, so now at this point in our discussion, before I introduce a little more information about the workshop, um, your first class has the subtitle of Balancing Form, Feelings, Ideas, and Technique. I wonder if you could share with us um, an example of when you've had to balance all of those things and what that sounded like when it came out as a song. Sure, I, I appreciate that question because the entire the entire first two hours, uh, which once again is a standalone uh, session, it's a prerequisite for the other two sessions. But but you don't have to take the additional two workshops to uh, hopefully get some value from the first session. So what I'm going to do during that session is I'm going to take several of so several songs that I have written and songs by other songwriters uh, uh, and I am going to play them and then I will talk a little bit about what was the idea what was the inspiration behind that song what what caused that song to be written uh, we'll then talk about the structure of the song for example uh, is this a ballad form where you just have a sequence of of verses that and no chorus and no bridge and and just one one section after another or is it a verse chorus form or what what uh, songwriters call an a a b a form there are various various th things we'll talk about uh, several of those forms 
Uh, I'll try to keep this. Uh, one of the interesting things about preparing the class is, is finding interesting songs, having them have different structures so you get an education about what the different structures of the uh, are available to you uh, or available to songwriters. But then we'll actually, and I'll be distributing lyric sheets for people to look at, um, we'll take a look at some of the nuances that people, so that songwriters, some of the techniques songwriters do that people hear, but maybe don't realize they're hearing, hearing that, that, that cause the song to be something tighter than simply a, 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 a prose recitation. One of the songs that I'm going to be doing um, an analysis of is one that I wrote called The Best Thing We Do. And it was, it, it's a memorial song to John Prime, the, the beloved songwriter uh, that, uh, that uh, who, who passed away. He was, he was one of the earliest uh, victims of COVID. Um, and the, this is a, this is a, I'll, I'll sing you the first, the first couple of verses. It's very short. Um, there was a full moon, a pink moon, the night that John Prine died. Laura called to let me know, she said. She just sat and cried. Three or four chords, a handful of rhymes, songs joyful, witty, and wise. Three or four verses, and just for a time, we saw the world through his eyes. And it goes on. Um, so we'll talk a little bit uh, about how that song is structured. There are two verses at the beginning, and then there's kind of an extended chorus, and we'll, 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 we'll look at that. Then I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that cause that song to work. work. Um, for example, the second verse call, says, Laura called to let me know. Okay, I purposefully used the word called instead of phoned because we've got Laura and called and let, okay? Three L words all within the same line. It's a technique that poets and lyricists use called alliteration. Okay, one other thing, just as an example that I did, if you remember the first line of the song, there was a full moon, a pink moon, the night that John Prine died. Okay. After you finish the first two verses and you go into an extended chorus, then there's a little guitar instrumental that plays. And then the third verse picks up like this. Tonight, there's a dog tooth moon, August becoming September. Okay, well, I very purposely, purposefully tied that third verse with the dog tooth moon to the first verse, the, the pink moon, a full moon. Um, and so it, it pulls you in or it, 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 it's like a little glue that holds the song together. And those, are, those are examples of things and there are dozens of them uh, that songwriters use, little techniques like that. Some of them I, I I put in purposefully. Others, uh, others, I only discover later that oh, I didn't even realize I did that, uh, which is a, a cool thing. So, that's uh, the the inspiration for that song was obviously John Prine. But I'm a member of a songwriters group that gets a prompt regularly, and the, that particular time when I wrote that song, the prompt was write about somebody famous, and. That was my choice. So, those are those are little stories. Uh, that that's the we'll we'll analyze several songs, both my songs and other folk songs, with with that in mind. Thanks, Walter. So that's a good taste of what will happen in the class on May fifth, and followed up by 
um, those people who are interested in actually trying their hand at some of the things that you'll talk about in the first class on May 5th, followed up with the Songwriters Workshop, which will take place on May 12th and 19th, and also in person at Drake Field. And you can find a full description of the workshops on page 31 of your catalog. So Walter, I'm gonna thank you for your time today and helping us to have a little bit of insight into the joy that you'll bring us on May 5th and the technique and um, wisdom that you'll bring us on May 12th and 19th. And um, sign off here of this edition of Ollie Exchange. Thanks, Walter. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, uh, Judith, very much.